gospel is a continuation of a theme that Luke has focused upon not only prior to what we've read but for the most part through his entire gospel the kingdom of God and I want you to notice that there is a development in what we have seen in the past few Sundays leading up to this morning's gospel Let's briefly look at what we've talked about. Chapter 14, we see that Jesus meets at a, at a uh, Sabbath meal in the house of a Pharisee. He then goes on and has this conversation. In the middle of the passage, he starts talking about the Great Supper, and then towards the end of the Gospel, he basically says, and none of those who were invited shall sob. Startling words. <laughs> then at the end, he starts talking about the cost of discipleship leading into this morning's gospel where he gives two parables discussing the same theme, that which was lost being found. Now, it's, an, it's interesting to note how Luke presents this morning's gospel because this morning's gospel is the individual searching for that which is precious. Let me reread the gospel to you this morning, just the, the 10 verses. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And Jesus spake the parable unto them, saying, What a man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven, over one sinner that repenteth, more than ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance. Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle, and sweep the house, and seek diligently till she find it. And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. And may God bless the reading of his word. And we've talked about repetition in scripture. I, I've mentioned to you the significance of Jesus saying something twice and what that means in the Hebrew mindset. That we underline, we put exclamation points when the Jews wanted to emphasize something, they would repeat it. Truly, truly, I say unto you, we see many times in scripture. Here, Jesus is repeating the same conceptual parable. Look at what you have here. One sheep gets lost. Think about the environment in which these shepherds worked. Craggly hills, desert, cold, laborious effort to just go find one sheep. The same thing with this poor woman. She loses one coin. She lights a candle. She wearies herself searching to find this one coin. Jesus is telling his listeners that there is no amount of effort to which the Father will not go. There is no obstacle the Son will not overcome to find those lost sheep. And remember who we're talking about, because this becomes significant not only in this particular gospel, but in the way Luke presents his parables. Remember that from chapter 10 till chapter 22, this is, the, this is the theme that Luke is hammering. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. Every message that Jesus preached about the kingdom of God, Luke is 
included in these in these chapters. And that which Jesus is searching, that to which he's referring in these two illustrations, he mentions in Matthew 10, 5, and I mentioned it last week. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into the city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And again in Matthew 15, 22, And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast, she was in Tyre and Sidon, and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after her. For uh, she crieth after us. But Jesus answered and said, I am not sent unto the lost. I am not set, sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Now I'm not going to go into this gospel. I preached on this. If you're interested, you can go to YouTube and see it. It's called The Dog's Faith. Uh, I preached on it April 29th of 2011. But notice, he was sent to the lost house of Israel. But this woman was not from the lost house of Israel. This woman was a Canaanite. This woman comes from a tradition of human sacrifice. And notice what she says to Jesus when he points out to her that it is not good for the, for the individual to throw crumbs to the dogs. Crumbs that belong to the children. She says, yeah, it's master, that is true. You're absolutely right. She says, but even dogs eat the crumbs off the master's table. We say that every Sunday. This act of humility, this act of devotion. Do you realize we say this every Sunday in the prayer of humble access? We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs from thy table. We are identifying with the Canaanite woman. Do you realize that? This is what Jesus came to do. He came to seek and to save the lost sheep of Israel. But in this gospel sequence, in this gospel sequence, over the past few weeks, Luke points out something profound. That Jesus is ministering to everyone. Yes, he's talking to the Pharisee. But look at the audience. And I'll touch on this in just a minute. But I want you to look at the audience. I'm going to read three verses from these two chapters. And I want you to just listen. If I can remember where Luke is in the Bible. Luke 14. Usually I write these out on a sheet of paper. Chapter, one, uh, chapter 14, verse 1. Now it happened as he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees. Okay, so here's the context. He's in the house of a Pharisee. 1425. Now great multitudes went with him. So after he tells the Pharisees, none of you are going to, none of those who were called and invited, none of you are going to sup at the dinner. Now great multitudes follow him. And then Jesus goes into explaining what the cost of discipleship is. And he lays it out pretty heavy. Read 14 through, uh, read the 20, 25, 26 through the end of the chapter, chapter, where he says, take up your cross. Count the cost. A king doesn't go into battle without counting the cost, without understanding what it's going to cost him. Just because you heard me tell these people that they're not invited to the supper, 
and you want to come and take their place. Don't think it's a free ride. Count the cost. And then after he says that, look at this morning's gospel. Then, then, so first Jesus goes to the Pharisees. Now we have great multitudes. Then we have publicans, tax collectors, and sinners that come out and meet with him. It's as if there's a flood, a crescendo of individuals rising, this swell of followers. Once Jesus said, these people will not be invited to the Great Supper. Tax collectors. Don't think of this morning, don't think of the IRS today targeting conservatives. These guys were worse. A tax collector was a Jew conscripted by Romans to sit at various times to collect Roman taxes. Fine. The only difference is they didn't get paid by Rome. So what did they do? They extorted the Jews. They extorted their own people. So you have a household of three people. You have five sheep. You're required to pay one denarius. Okay. Matthew's sitting down. You come up to him, and he says, what do you got? I got three in my family and five sheep. Okay, that'll be 10 denarius. Excuse me? That's 10 denarius. One for Rome, nine for me. Now you know why the Jews hated the tax collectors. Because they were worse criminals than the Romans. Because at least the Romans just wanted flat tax. Yet these are the people that come to meet Jesus. And here, the Pharisees start complaining. This man receives sinners. And not only does he receive these sinners, he's eating with them. This is defilement. This is eating with the reprobate. Jesus came for the lost sheep of Israel and now everybody but the lost sheep of Israel is coming to Christ to listen to him. Which should raise a question. Who are the lost sheep of Israel? I want to read something to you. Romans chapter 4. I apologize, this is really tacky. I, I just didn't want to print out 27 pages of scripture references. The Apostle Paul, after indicting the world in the first three chapters of Romans, saying the world is completely sinful, everybody, it doesn't matter who you are, pagan, Gentile, Jew, it's irrelevant. So everybody stands condemned for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So what do we say then? That Abraham, our father, has found according to the flesh. So big deal, what do we say? For if Abraham was justified by works, he is something to boast about, but not before God. For what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are counted, not as grace, but as debt. In other words, you do X, you get Y for doing X. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So in, in other words, you do nothing and you get everything. You don't sit there and expend energy. You don't labor. You can't labor because there's nothing that you're going to do in your sinful nature that is going to merit grace. Paul has just laid out the indictment in the first three chapters of Romans. You're a sinner. 
You're a sinner. Everybody's a sinner. What do you think a sinner can do? Do you think a sinner can do anything positive to God? No. Abraham was a sinner. Abraham didn't do anything. Abraham was justified because God said, Abraham, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And Abraham believed. He trusted. He committed his life to that promise and lived that way. And this counted, this accounting, this is an economic term. This is the way accountants think. You have debits and credits. And you have this side of the ledger and you have that side of, that side of the ledger. I'm doing it again. This is the entire conversation Paul had with Philemon. <clears throat> Look, I understand your slave left you. I understand Onesimus took off. But whatever sins he committed, don't put those sins on him. Put those sins on me. If you're looking at Onesimus's ledger, and he has red on this side of the ledger, and there's no black on this side of the ledger. Philemon, I want you to take my ledger, which has black, and I want you to put my black in his ledger and take his red and put it in my ledger. This is the accounting that God sees when he looks at us. He takes our red on our ledger and he places that on Christ. And he takes Christ's black and puts it on us. Now that's in accounting terms. If we're going to use spiritual terms, it would be the white of Christ's righteousness, his righteous robe. Who then is the true Israel? Is it the Pharisee with whom Jesus was eating that night? Or that day? Or is it these multitudes that keep coming and coming and coming by faith to Christ? You see, Jesus is freaking the Pharisees out. We used to say in the 60s, he's rocking their world. Because here the Pharisees are the righteous. Here's the 99, and there are different interpretations of this passage. I know somebody actually says that the righteous are angels. I don't understand that. I believe that Jesus is referring to the Pharisees. The Pharisees would have understood it to mean them. And here they are. And the Messiah is to come for the lost sheep of Israel, the house of Israel. He's supposed to come for them. And he leaves them. And he goes after that one. He's that woman who dropped that coin and goes searching until she wearies herself for that one. Christ has told the Pharisees, don't think just because you have a certain heritage, you are guaranteed a seat at the table. Listen to what Paul says in reference to this. I say the truth in Christ, Romans chapter 9. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. And the Greek word is an oppressive burden. Paul is agonizing. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Judge me, accursed, cut me off from Christ for my fellow Jews who are Israelites. To whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory 
and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises of God. Whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came? That's a resume that anybody would love to have. And here Paul is saying, these are my brethren. These are the true Jews. I mean, these are the Jews. These are the ones I wish I were cut off from Christ for. Why? So that they would be counted as true members of the true Israel. Not as though the word of God hath not taken effect. Because, and here's the key, they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they children. But in Isaac shall they be called. I mentioned it last week. You go through scripture and you look at God's sovereignty. And it is always the lesser in the covenant. It is always the younger. It's never the older. He chose Isaac over Ishmael. He chose Jacob over Esau. He chose Manasseh over Ephraim in Joseph. Even Joseph was like, what, the 11th child born? And you go through. And God specifically chooses the lesser over the greater. Just because you're of the seed of Abraham doesn't mean that you are true Israel. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. Are there three words more frightening than Paul ever issued in Scripture? These are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Tax collectors, sinners, great multitude, the diseased, the lost, the reprobate, those who are outside of the promises, those who are outside of the covenants and the blessings of God. The true lost sheep of Israel are you and I. Abraham's true seed by faith by Abraham's faith. We who were not originally invited as guests to the great king's supper. We who were pulled in from the outskirts of the kingdom. We who were not born with the righteous wedding garments of the groom, but wear the true groom's righteous garments by faith. This is why, this is why in the parable Jesus tells us that the master sent the servant out to beat the bushes, drag people in from everywhere, Go. Go and tell people. This is not an ethnic thing anymore. You're not excluded simply because you're not a Jew. You now have a place at the table. You're now invited to sit with the king of the universe. You now have an opportunity to partake of the greatest meal in history, to sit down with the Messiah, 
And don't worry that you're not a Jew. Because you are one if you have Abraham's faith. That's what we should be telling people. Every day. Don't worry about the fact that you were not called to sup. Because now you're invited. Because the original guests were turned away. And they have to come as we have to come. By faith. By faith. And then all of those wonderful gifts that they were given. The law. The covenant promises. All of those gifts are ours because we are now the adopted children of the king. But none of that happens unless you go out into the hedges, into the streets, into the villages, into the towns, into the workplace, into the schools, into the supermarkets, into the ballparks, into the swimming pool, at the beaches, and you tell your friends, this is where you need to be. That's the grace you need to receive. Because without that faith, you will not suck.